Hello everybody, this is Alex, pastor of Calvary Church. I wanna thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you for your support in subscribing, liking, sharing our channel with friends and family. It really means the world and our growth over the last couple of years online has been absolutely incredible. I wanna invite you to participate in a special Sunday that we have coming up on Sunday, December 10th. Sunday, December 10th is Heart for the House Sunday at Calvary Church. What is Heart for the House? It's a special offering that we all bring that goes over and above our yearly tithes. This special offering we've been saving and this goes straight to making a difference around the world. It goes to impact our city and it goes to make an influence all around the world. It's because of this offering that this year we've helped thousands of people receive food or an education, hear the gospel, and I'm telling you, your support really makes a massive difference. Would you pray about it and talk to your family and see how you can contribute and help out reach our goal of $500,000? We're all praying about it. It's a special day at Calvary where it's going to set us up to win and continue to make a difference in 2024. Thank you so much. We love our online family. Your support, really, it gets to the heart as we continue taking the gospel of Jesus Christ. We love you. Thank you for being with us. Right before we get to this passage, many of you will be familiar with this story. Uh, this is the story of, of the 12 spies um, who were going to go and check out the good land that God has promised the people of Israel. Before we get here, you know the story. Uh, Moses takes the children of Israel or leads them out of um, Egypt. And they come through uh, the Red Sea and it parts. And then they have their wedding night with God, you know, and they're getting married and God's giving the law up on Sinai, but they're cheating on God down in the camp, you know, on their wedding night. God's like, are you kidding me right now? We've been married for five seconds. <laughs> um, and that's just this story of how God is going to be faithful to Israel, even when Israel's not faithful to them. And it's this a beautiful story of grace um, and God's goodness and God's kindness and his long suffering. Um, and I'm thankful for a God who's long-suffering and kind, and, right? So, so he's bringing them, and they are they're the worst, okay? They're honestly the worst. And when you're reading these stories, you're going, why are you doing that right now? You know, it's just like, no, you know? Um, and so they're always complaining and da-da-da-da-da. So, but God's like, I love you, I love you. I kind of, I can't, you're annoying, but I love you. And they get to um, basically this, this, this area that is just outside of the promised land. And so now God tells Moses, choose 12 spies, one from each of the 12 tribes of Israel, and send them over. And so right before we get here to Numbers 13, 16, they read out the list of the, of the, of the guys who are going to go on this 40-day camping trip to find out what's going on in the promised land. So these were the names of the men whom Moses sent to spy out the land. And, and Moses called Hosea. So Hosea is one of the guys who is going to be spying out the land. Moses called Hosea, the son of Nun, Joshua. Changes this guy's name. Okay? We're going to come, we're going to come back to that. Moses sent them to spy out the land of Canaan. And said to them, go up into the Negev and go up into the hill country and see what the land is and whether the people who dwell in it are strong or weak, uh, whether they are few or many, whether the land that they dwell in is good or bad, whether the cities that they dwell in are camps or strongholds, and whether the land is rich or poor, and whether there are trees in it or not. Uh, be of good courage, bring some of the fruit of the land. It's like uh, the details in it. It's like, a, it's like my wife sending me to the grocery store. <laughs> kind of reminiscent of that. And I always tell her, um, don't tell me, text me. Because if you don't text me, it's not coming home. <laughs> right? And so Moses sends them the text with all of the details, right? And, and bring me some fruit. Now the time was the season of the first uh, ripe grapes. <laughs> first ripe grapes. So they went up and spied out the land from the wilderness of Zinder Rahab near Libu Hamath. They went up into the Negev and came to Hebron, Ahimon, Sheshai, and Telmai. The descendants of Anak were there. 
Now, if you've ever read any of Frank Peretti's books, you would know that the descendants of Anak is a bad sign. Okay? That, those are giants. Okay? So that's a little bit concerning. Okay? Imagine the original audience reading this, and they're like, there's giants? That's a problem. Okay? Uh, Hebron, or he- Hebron was built seven years before Zona in Egypt, um, a detail that is, is not important to us today. And they came to the valley of Eshkol, and they cut down from there a branch with a single cluster of grapes. And they carried it on a pole between two of them. Now, when the Bible is ridiculous, you have to slow down. That's ridiculous. I don't know if you've been to Publix recently, but they're not selling a cluster of grapes that is a two-man job anymore. Right? If you go and you get a cluster of grapes, it's just one hand. Right? You just walk out. You're like, thank you. You know, Publix is not the promised land. It just isn't, right? The promised land is this place that God has for every believer and every congregation. There is an individual place that God wants to bring you. A place in Christ Jesus. A place of destiny. A place that God's called you to. A place for your family. And a place for us as a people. As a church. As Calvary Church. God has a promised land for Calvary Church. And it's a good place where God's bringing you. God's already decided where it is. He knows where he wants to bring this church. Right? It's his idea. It's not your idea. Right? Right? And it's ridiculously good. It's ridiculously good. If you saw the grapes, you would be blown away. The point is that God's goodness is ridiculous. You you won't even believe it. If we told you about the future that God wants to bring to you, you'd be like, no, I don't believe that. That's impossible. Grapes? A single cluster? Two guys carrying it? Yes. That's what God wants to bring us into. A place of abundance, a place of more than enough, a place where God is doing great and powerful and wonderful things. All right, let's keep moving. They carried it on a pole. They also brought some pomegranates and figs. Maybe Moses was having some bowel issues. So he was like, bring some, it was on the shopping list. Okay. That place was called the Valley valley of Eshkol because of the cluster that the people of Israel cut down from there. Eshkol literally means cluster. At the end of 40 days, they returned from spying out the land, and they came to Moses and Aaron and to all the congregation of the people of Israel in the wilderness of of Paran at Kadesh. They brought back word to them and to all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land, and they told him, we came to the land to which you sent us. It flows with milk and honey. It flows with milk and honey. That is ancient Near Eastern hyperbole for fully loaded. It's fully loaded. What does fully loaded mean? It's just it's got all the bells and whistles. What does the bells and whistles mean? It's hyperbole. It means it's really awesome. Right? You following me? Okay. And this is its fruit. However, the people who dwell on the land are strong and the cities are fortified and very large. And besides, we saw the descendants of Anak there. The Amalekites dwell on the land of the Negev. The Hittites, the Jebusites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Mosquito Bites. It's a lot of bites. It's problems. Okay. Now, this is the first report. There are going to be two reports. We're going to read the second report in a moment. But this first report is just the reality. It's okay to see obstacles in your life and name them and note them and recognize that there are obstacles. It's not a lack of faith to recognize that there are giants. There's some, have you ever met some of these Christians? Right? And they're like, hey man, how are you? <coughs> I'm ruling and reigning with Christ Jesus. <coughs> Dude, I think you have COVID. <coughs> I'm seated in heavenly places. I am not, I do not have COVID, right? It's just a symptom. 
uh, dude, I think you're sick and you need to go home now. You know, like some people like they, oh, if I say that I'm sick, if I say that there's a problem, then I'm agreeing with the problem or I am the problem. And you know, it's interesting when you read the New Testament, particularly the, you know, the gospels, Jesus would say, you know, hey, what's going on? And people would say, what was wrong with them? (laughs) So there is that. Being sick is a prerequisite for being healed by Jesus. Like, admitting your need is a good thing. Okay, right? And so this first report is fine. Pastor, I don't, you know... I don't know, man, you know, like, we, we, there's too many people coming to our church. Yes, there are too many people coming to Calvary right now. Just to be honest with you, there's too many of you in this room. The only person that likes a full room is a pastor. You know what I mean? Like, if there was half, then it would be, like, yes, I could relax, I could lay out, I could put my Bible beside me, have my coffee on this seat. Right? But you are part of a, you're part of a growing church. It's a problem. <laughs> Being a part of a growing church sucks. <laughs> Can't find a parking spot. People that you don't know are sitting in your row. It's my family's row. We've been, we've been sitting in this row for 10 years. Do they not know that this is our row? Right? You can't, you can't put your purse underneath your seat anymore. It's not safe. Why do we come here? It's annoying. Right? God is here. Something is, something's happening here, right? But, but you have problems. Right? It's like we need more space. We need a, a bigger... We need a bigger Everything. What is this? A center for ants? You know, you need you, you need a bigger church. Pastor, what are we gonna do? We don't have enough land. You know, like it's okay to to see these things. Well, it's gonna need, we're gonna need money for that. We need money. That that's okay. It's not a bad report. It's just reality. Right? Okay, let's keep reading. Canaanites dwell by the sea. Next verse. And along the Jordan. But Caleb quieted the people before Moses. Let's go up at once and occupy it. And this is Caleb. Caleb is that dude who's always like, he's a bit crazy. You know that one friend that's always getting your whole friend group in trouble? Dude, let's just do it. Let's do this. Let's do it. Let's just not do it. Let's think about it. Can we, can we do that? No, just do, it's the do it guy. Don't bring do it guy. My brother Gabriel is the do-it guy. The, he's the worst. He always gets us in trouble. You know? I'm going to talk about him a little bit more in a second. But that's Caleb. Let's just go, man. You know? The men who had gone up with him said, We're not able to go up against the people. For they are stronger than we are. We're not able to go into the destiny and do the things that God's called us to do. We're not able to do that. And so they brought to the people of Israel a bad report. And here comes the bad report. It's the second report. And this is what they said. The land through which we have gone to spy it out is a land that devours its inhabitants. Land doesn't eat people. That's not, that's not reality. That's hyperbole of fear. That's what my, my psychologist calls catastrophization. Nathan, you're catastrophizing. What do you mean? You're, you're, you're thinking of every possible worst scenario and then multiplying it. Yeah, I know, but they're all going to happen. No, they're not. You're catastrophizing. I like to catastrophize at one in the morning. That's my favorite time to be afraid of everything. You know what I mean? I wake up in the morning... And I'm like, oh, God is with me. I read my Bible, listening to worship music. And I'm just like, I'm going to defeat all of the giants. And I'm not afraid of anything, right? And by about 5 o'clock, all of the fruit of the Spirit has fallen off of my tree. (laughs) And then by about 1 in the morning, I'm just, we're all going to 
gonna die. Right? You're like watching Fox News. We're all gonna die, CNN. We're all gonna die. You know? And then my wife will like send me some like horrible TikTok video about a disease that you can get from going on a slide at a water park. It's a brain eating amoeba. We're all gonna die. Oh God, why did you even make me alive? And then I fall asleep. And I do it all over again. Oh yeah, it's life. <laughs> the land devours its inhabitants. It eats people. Calm down, dude. It land doesn't eat people. Yes, it does. Okay. All the people that we saw in it are of great height. Now everybody's a giant. Right? I went to the grocery store. They were giants. You know, went to, they were giants. Everybody there was a giant. Well, no. You know, uh, there we saw the Nephilim. Oh, now it's Nephilim. It's not just sons of Anak. It's Nephilim. I don't know if you've read Genesis 6 lately. It's fun. It's a fun one. In Genesis 6, angels marry human women and create like uh, uh, another race, like a completely different type of, of, basically aliens. They're half man, half angel. Crazy. They're like these, these freaks, super freaks. And so now they're like, the Nephilim, they're going to rip our arms off and eat our heads. Spooky. And we seemed to ourselves like grasshoppers, and so we seem to them. So now this is just, this is just, it's in the realm of the ridiculous now. Let's keep reading. Then all the congregation raised a loud cry. Obviously, the people wept that night. I can imagine. <laughs> it's one in the morning. They're just, we're all good. <laughs> all the people. All the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The whole congregation said to them, would that we had died in the land of Egypt <laughs> or would that we had died in this world. They're losing their mind. You see, when you begin to embrace catastrophization, you begin to make stupid plans for your life. Right? Have you ever been like, you know, you know it's a brain-eating amoeba. I'll never go in the ocean again. Never. I will never have fun again. Right? He got, a, he got a tick. He got a tick from going to the beach. I will never go to the beach again. Maybe I'll go once. For my, for my birthday, obviously. I have to go for that, but... Never again, right? Like, you start to make crazy plans. Anxiety is fear of future pain. Anxiety is fear of future pain. And so the future is painful. You begin to make all of these stupid decisions. But you see, God's not called his people to live lives of anxiety and catastrophization. Not, not called me to that. I'm not called to that. I'm not, I'm not called to ridiculous fear or saying things that are untrue about the future that God's called me to. And that's, that's the difference. It's okay to talk about the realities. It's not okay to begin to create these fantasies of catastrophe. Because then what you're, what you're saying is God... I don't trust you. You suck. You're bringing bad things into my life. Would that we had died in the land of Egypt or would that we had died in this wilderness and God's thinking, maybe we will run with that. That could be good. Yeah, maybe I will kill you here. Why is the Lord bringing us into this land to fall by the sword? Our wives and our little ones will become a prey. Would it not be better for us to go back to Egypt? No. You want to know why? There's nothing left. You just destroyed them. 
Their water's all blood. There's frogs everywhere. All of their crops have been destroyed. Their animals have been destroyed. And they're probably harboring a bit of resentment because, I don't know, you killed all their firstborn. <laughs> Give it a hundred years. Visit later. Let's choose a leader and go back to Egypt. Then Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before all the assembly of the congregation. And when Moses and Aaron hit the deck, it's usually because fire is going to come from the Lord and scorch everybody. Right? Joshua and Caleb see Moses and Aaron fall on their faces and they're like, we're all going to die. And so they tear their clothes like they're at a funeral. Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb... Uh, the son of Jephunneh, who were among those who had spied out the land, tore their clothes and said to all the congregation of the people of Israel, the land which we passed through to spy it out is an exceedingly good land. If the Lord delights in us, and P.S., he does. He delivered us from Egypt. We were slaves. We were nobodies. We had, no, we, we had nothing to offer him. We still don't, but for some reason, he loves us. There's prophetic destiny on our life because of the promises that he made to Abraham. There's something on my life because of the promises that the Father has made to the Son. Charles Spurgeon called mercy and goodness. You know, David says, surely mercy and goodness will follow me all the days of my life. He called them the hound dogs of heaven. Because when, you, when you're in Jesus Christ, you have the scent of Jesus Christ on you. And those dogs are going to, they're following you. Right? Because they smell Jesus on me. My life is hidden in Christ. The Father loves the Son. He loves Jesus. And so there's going to be some, there's going to be some sort of prophetic destiny on my life because my life has become hidden in Christ. If the Lord delights in us, he will bring us into this land and give it to us. A land that flows with milk and honey. There's the hyperbole of faith. Only do not rebel against the Lord. Ooh. What does it mean to rebel against the Lord? Well, we just saw a great example of it. It's when you're catastrophizing and you're weaponizing the hyperbole of fear against the purposes and the plans and the good purposes of God. Do not fear the people of the land. They're bred for us. Their protection is removed from them and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. All right. Let's really quickly, let's go to Revelation 21.8. This is the end of the book of Revelation. I don't know if you've read the book of Revelation recently, but it's not the most fun book to ever read. Okay. It's a, I get anxiety reading the book of Revelation. I get anxiety doing a lot of things, but reading the book of Revelation is anxiety-inducing. And for me, I just want to get to the end of the book of Revelation quickly because I know that we win. <laughs> Do you mean people are dropping dead? There's curses. I'm like, no, 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 Revelation 21. Thank you, right? And so you get there, and Jesus is like, he's dealing with all of the bad people, right? He's like, thank you, God, yeah. So, you know, he, the faithless, donk, detestable, donk, murderers, donk, sexual immoral, donk, Harry Potter, double donk. <laughs> Idolaters, liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and so Yeah, God, donk, I'm in there, right? But the problem is, I see my name at the very top. The cowardly. Now, I'm not, uh, I am not the paragon of, of, of bravery, to be quite honest with you. I'm the exact opposite. So my mom, I'm, I'm, I res my dad is like brave. My mom is very, very nervous wreck. That's where I got it from. We call my mom Debbie Downer. She knows all the statistics on how you could die at any given moment. <laughs> right? At Thanksgiving, she'll be like, you know, chew your turkey carefully. 33% of people that are eating it today will die. <laughs> they'll choke. They'll be choking. <laughs> I was like, thank you. You know, as, she's, as she dollops a little bit of mash on there. Be careful with the mash, too. 
you can get really bad indigestion and you could have a heart attack from it. Or, I don't know, you know, it's like, my mom's like that. You know what I mean? Like she, when she comes into a church, she's always looking up to make sure that the light fixtures are, are you know, attached securely. She's, right? You're, I mean, if that fell, you'd be, you know. <laughs> Same to you, buddy. That's my mom. We're crazy. You know what I mean? My mom, mom, we're nuts. My mom texts me late at night all the dangerous things in life. It's like, oh, great, new fear unlocked. Thanks, mom. (laughs) Why does she do that? (laughs) You know, my brother Gabriel, he's like Braveheart. His face is always painted half blue. He's... he picks fights with people. He's annoying. He, he's just, he, everywhere, he, he's, he's, he's always been that kid. Ever since we were kids, he'd jump off a bridge into water just straight away. He's not afraid of roller coasters, you know. He, he'd go on everything. He was, he's a nut job. He's a nut job. He, he's like a hardcore, you know, Christian, and, and he wants to die with a, a spear in his gut in the Amazon. <laughs> You know, like witnessing to some tribe. That's his life dream. You following me here? Like being around him gives me anxiety. (laughs) Now, thankfully, like God's not sending people who are scared of roller coasters to hell. That's not what Revelation 21 is about. Revelation 21, well, the book of Revelation, one of the major themes in the book of Revelation is faithful witness. And Jesus introduces himself in Revelation 1 as the faithful witness. Basically, Jesus is like, look, I stayed true to my father. It cost me my life, uh, right? But I was a faithful witness. And if you stay true to me, it, it might cost you something. And so the, this theme of, of faithful witness runs throughout the book of Revelation. And the question is, are you going to be a faithful witness to God or are you going to sell out and you're going to be, you know, in order to get economic mobility, social mobility, you know, a better ESG credit score, you know, like you, you, you will sell out and no, I'm not a Christian. I'm going to be ashamed, right? And, and we kind of, we're kind of at a, at a place right now in, in the church where, uh, we're, 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 facing an, uh, we're facing some cowardice, wow. right? Like, we, we see some realities. Uh, you, I mean, I could, I could go through them, but I mean, like, I, I speak at, 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 at youth conferences, you know, all over, and, and young people are struggling at yeah. the moment, you know, to like, are, they, are you going to be a faithful witness of Jesus Christ, or are you going to join your friends on TikTok? And, and spout absolute nonsense and vitriol that is demonic and totally opposed to the, to the, to the scriptures. Well, you know, nobody will love me. Nobody will. Well, totally, but yeah, Jesus loves you. And that's really the only person that you need to, be care, you need to care about. You know, like, like, like his, his opinion, God's opinion of you is really the only opinion that you need to care about. And so we're at, we're, at a, we're at a place right now. Are we going to be a church that, that you know, stands with Scripture? Or are we, gonna, you know, are we going to try to curry favor with the world and you know, take less politically hostile positions? Uh, you know, like, oh, you know, I, I, I don't like abortion, but I think it's okay that other people kill babies. Like, well, yeah, I don't know if that's, no, I think murder is just murder, you know. How dare you say that? Well, it's a church. I'm a pastor. I'm going to preach the word of God. I don't, I don't care what you think. Wait, well, there's, there's so many different issues that, 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 that the, the church is facing. Now, in, in, in this story, in, in this story of Numbers, you know, the issue, the, the, the cowards are the guys who are going, um, we're, we're never going to be able to, go into that land. We, we can't do it. And, 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 it's, and it's partly true. They can't. But, but, but part of the issue is that they don't realize that it's God's land and it's God's idea. It's not their idea. It's not their land. Right? You have to understand that when you came to Jesus Christ, you now be, your, your butt belongs to Jesus. 
And Jesus has a future for you. You don't own your life. You don't own your gifts. You don't own your talents. You're just a steward. So when God saved you, he goes, hey, I, I, we have some things to do now. And there's some places that I want to bring you. And sometimes we can go, God, I see the places that you want to bring me, but I could never do that. And, and you're right. There's places that you can't do, but, but God's calling you into them. And you see, this is how faith works. Faith comes by hearing. Right? Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of Christ. Faith doesn't start with Nathan Finocchio or you. Faith isn't whatever I want. I want a Cadillac Escalade. Right? I, I want the best Cadillac Escalade out there with all of the, the spinning, you know, no roof, tear it off, leather, power windows, flowing with milk and honey. Right? But God hasn't told me that I can have a Cadillac Escalade. So I can pray a prayer of hope for my Cadillac Escalade. But I can't pray a prayer of faith because faith comes by hearing. You following me here? Right? So... If God's told me, I have a place for you, it's the promised land, that's where I'm taking you. I can believe God. Amen. You following me here? Yeah. And the issue here, the, the rebellion is God's told them, I have a place for you. And this is the place that I'm bringing you. And they're going, I can't do it. And so we're not going to do it. You, you're right, you can't do it, but the promised land was never on you. It's not about you, it was God's idea. And all you need to do is believe God. When he speaks, we believe. I wanna close real, real quickly here in a second. I got three minutes and I'm done. Some of you are like, yes, I can almost taste those empanadas. Jesus said, I will build my church. Jesus said, I will build my church. It's the only thing that he's building. It's the only thing. That, that's what he's building. We have him saying that. The church is the bride of Christ. It's who he's coming back for. He's obsessed with the church. So many people right now are like, when is Jesus coming back? I'll tell you when Jesus is coming back, when the bride is pure and spotless, right? when, she's, when she's absolutely gorgeous. Now, she's not there yet, but she's getting there. She's on the treadmill. She's doing keto. Come on, you following me here. Right, the church, God's doing something in the church. All over the world, the church is becoming beautiful and she's becoming glorious. I know that Jesus will be, will be back soon as the church becomes glorious because Jesus is coming back for a glorious and a triumphant church. Not for a weak, anemic church that needs to be pulled out of the world because Jesus sucks at doing his job, which is building the church. Now, Jesus is the greatest builder and the church will be triumphant and victorious. Now, you are called to build the church of Jesus Christ with Jesus. You're called to build like Noah, building the ark. But the designs and the plans were God, right? He, God was the architect and Noah was the, the co-builder with God. And we're, we're called to build the church of Jesus Christ. So yeah, you're part of a church that's growing and there's gonna be a lot of challenges. And you know, in the coming days, I mean, I don't know what, I'm looking at the property and I'm, I'm sitting here with Adam going, how are we gonna do this? How, what are we, you guys need a bigger church immediately. It, the, the next service is gonna be awful. There's people that are gonna be hanging from there. <laughs> Literally, they put seats underneath. There's going to be people lying down just listening to my sermon under, underneath the, the, the stage. If you remember when we were reading, God changed Hosea's name to Joshua. Hosea means he saves or I save. Right before Moses sends Hosea on the camping trip to see the promised land, he changes his name. He, Come here, dude. I got to change your name. Okay? Your name's Hosea. It means you save or I save. 
I'm changing your name to Yeshua or Joshua, which means Yahweh saves. Because Hosea would look and he'd be like, oh my gosh, oh, I see the giants, right? And he'd pee in his pants a little bit. Come on, diaper change, right? Joshua sees the giants and he goes, I wonder how God is going to do this because Yahweh saves, right? I wonder, and and he begins to stir up his prophetic imagination. I wonder how God, I wonder how God's going to kill these Nephilim. Is is there going to be like an angelic biker gang with matching vests? They're on camels though. It's a camel gang. And then they're going to like, I don't know, roundhouse kick these dudes to the face. Is God going to send fireballs? I don't know how God's going to do it, but I know that he will do it because it's his idea. It's his church and Jesus is going to build his church. Come on, why don't you stand with me? Church, I'm telling you right now, Jesus is building Calvary Church. He's building, he's building his church and so he's going to do it. We, we, we see the challenges. We see, you know, the things that are happening, but I know this, that Jesus is building his church. If Elon Musk sold all of his everything and bought GameStop tomorrow, would you think about buying a little bit of GameStop? Right? If Warren Buffett sold everything he had and he bought GameStop tomorrow, would you think about investing in GameStop? If Nancy Pelosi bought GameStop tomorrow, Jesus is all in on the church. It's the only stock that he's bought. And he knows the future. It's a safe investment. Invest your life into the kingdom of God, into the things that God is building. And believe that God is gonna do what he said he's gonna do. The church isn't your idea, it's God's idea. He's building it, partner with the Lord, and see what God does in Miami and beyond, in Jesus' name. Come on, let me pray for you. Father, I thank you for this church. I thank you for a church that is building the kingdom of God. Father, we thank you for it. And God, I thank you for every every giver, everybody who gives of their time, their talent, their treasure. Father, I ask you that you would multiply your grace towards every single builder. Father, I pray that some people today would be released and just get caught up into the vision of the house, building the church of Jesus Christ, making her beautiful for her day of visitation in the coming days. We need a church that reflects the glory and the power of God. And Father, we thank you for what you're doing in our church. And we're believing that the best is yet to come. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Come on, one time, can we give it up for Jesus in the room? Hey, while we're standing, um, I would love to give somebody an opportunity as you were listening to Pastor Nathan. He's talking about God wants to build his church, the church of Jesus. Jesus is gonna come back for his bride. Now, here's the thing. To be a part of the bride, it it takes a requirement. And that requirement is for us to have full trust that Jesus is Savior and Lord. Well, what do I need saving from? Here's, Here's what we need saving from. The Bible says this, that there's a penalty to something called sin. Every single one of us, we've all sinned. Every single one of us. The sin, it literally means to miss the mark. Well, I don't know if I've ever missed the mark. Well, if you've ever thought wrong, if you've ever done wrong, if you've ever said wrong, you, you've sinned. You, you've, you've missed the mark. You've messed up compared to a holy and perfect God. Now, this sin, it's no joke. It's not just something that is ordinary. It's not something that we could play with. Sin, the Bible tells us that there is a price to this. There's a penalty to this sin. As a matter of fact, the Bible tells us that the weight, the penalty, the price of sin is death. Now, we can say, well, I know I'm going to die. I I know that's what's going to happen. I'm not just talking about a physical death because every single one of us are going to die physically. This death that we deserve because of our sin, because of our missing the mark, we deserve hell. That's what every single one of us, because of his holy and perfect standard, our sin, it separates us away from God and does not allow us to be in his presence. That's what we all deserve. But Jesus says, hey, the the penalty is death. I love you so much that I will pay that price for you. So he goes ahead, 2,000 years ago, he came on this earth, lived a completely perfect life, did what none of us could do, but yet suffered more than any of us, 
yet got beaten more than any of us will ever got beaten, experienced more pain than any of us could have ever could ever experience in our entire lifetime. One, because when we see that, we, God, he, he experienced pain. If I'm going through pain right now, I can experience first that there's a God who took on all of this first. And he said, he took on all that pain. They put him on what was probably the worst torture tool on the planet, which was a cross where they put nails in his hands, a crown of thorns on his head. They beat him, they embarrassed him, they stripped him naked. They did all these things, made fun of him. And they, they were literally just, he was a laughing stock at this moment. And while he's in all this pain, the worst pain he wasn't in, that wasn't even the worst pain he was in to get. The worst pain was the fact that he was gonna take that penalty, that price of all the sin of you, me, past, present, future, he was gonna take all of it at once, but what he was thinking on was you. He was you. So he didn't want you to experience that pain. He didn't want you to experience where we deserve to be. The Bible says that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. So that means, that because of that price that Jesus paid, he did not just die, but three days later he resurrected and he is alive today and he's in this very room. And as he's in this very room, what he wants to do is he wants to know you and he wants you to know him. And not just know him, but believe that he is the one that can save your life. Today, are you guilty? Are you full of shame? Are you anxious? Or do you have giants in your life like Pastor Nathan was just talking about? Like, I don't know if I can overcome these giants. I don't know if this promised land is for me. That wasn't for you to decide. God, this, is, this was God's plan for humanity, for him to save you from what we all deserve. And he just says, I just, I just wanna know you. He wants you to say, I, I, Jesus, you're the savior of my life. You're not just the savior of my life, but you're also gonna be Lord too, which means I give you the keys to my life too. Are you tired of running into wall after wall after wall after wall trying to do it on your own? Jesus says, hey, make me Lord too, which means I just, I just hand it all to you. I'm gonna ask if everybody could just close their eyes and bow their heads for just a moment. Jesus, he knows what you did yesterday. He knows what you did a week ago. He knows what you did a month ago. He knows what you did a year ago. He knows what you came in carrying. He knows the pain that you're holding on to. He knows what the things you haven't told anybody. And he says, I know it and I still love you. I still love you. He's gonna love you more than any person could ever love you. He's gonna love you more than any single human being, than anything. What you've been chasing is never gonna give you the satisfaction that you need. Have you been chasing money? Have you been chasing love? Have you been chasing sex? Have you been chasing all of these things? It's never going to satisfy you the way that Jesus will satisfy your life because he's the only thing that we were called to worship, to live after. If you're in this room and you're saying, hey, I'm broken, I need forgiveness of my sin. I need to know this savior that was talking about. I didn't know that I could be loved the way that you're talking about. I'm just gonna ask you, I'm gonna count to three. And when I count to three, I just want you to shoot up your hand. I'm not gonna embarrass you. I'm not gonna put a mic up in your hand, but I do wanna know who I am praying for because it is this decision that will change your life forever. You feel alone, you will no longer be alone because you have the living God by your side at all moments, at all times. If that's you, you're saying, hey, I need forgiveness of my sins. I need this brand new start. I need to know the living God. I wanna have a relationship with him. I'm gonna count to three and you can raise up your hand. One, two, three. If you wanna make a decision to follow Jesus, amen. Amen, God bless you. God bless you over here. God bless you over here, amen. Amen, God bless you in the back over here, amen. God bless you on the side over here, amen. Amen, God bless you all right over here. Is there anybody else? You wanna make a decision to follow Jesus today? Awesome, awesome. Hey, for every hand that just went up, it was about six or seven of you guys, I believe that you just made the greatest decision of your entire life. There is no better decision than the one of following Jesus. The Bible says, that if you believe in your heart, you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That's all it takes. It's a, it's a complete believing. I'm gonna believe this with all that I got. So I'm gonna ask that we're gonna go ahead and everybody's gonna join in on you, so it's not gonna just be you, but the whole church together, we're gonna celebrate this with you as we say this together. But I want you to repeat after me with this prayer. As we say this, dear Jesus, I open my heart. I invite you inside to be my friend, to be my savior, to be my God. Jesus, I'm sorry for everything that I've done. I want to follow you all the days of my life. Jesus, I put my faith in you, and I put my hope in you, and I put my trust in you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray, and everybody says, oh, come on, we can get a little bit louder. Everybody says, amen. Come on, can we throw a party for everybody that just made a decision to follow Jesus? Hey,
Okay, you just went from death to life, and we genuinely believe this is like a brand new birthday for you, and so we want to give you a gift if you made a decision. You'll see some of the things that we have for you. We got a free Bible for you, a notebook, a coffee mug, a free coffee voucher, more anything. We just want to get to know you, and so we have an incredible team right out front called the Connect Team, and there's a 10 out there. They would love to hand these, hand you one of these, and just get to know you, and just literally get you your next steps. Everybody has a next step. Your next step might be just to get into community, might to just get this gift, but we want to get this in your hands. And so one more time, can we make some noise for everybody that made a decision to follow Jesus in the room? Hey, I think we should leave here celebrating one more time. I'm going to pray one last time, and the band's going to go ahead and lead us into some more worship. But I hope that this message, it changed you. I hope it's, you got some giants in your life, you can overcome them today. But let's pray. Lord, I thank you, Jesus. I thank you for Calvary Church. I thank you for all that you're doing, and I believe for everybody in this room that may be facing a giant, that might be going through something big, I thank you that you've never left them nor forsaken them, but we believe you're going to take them through the other side. Lord, we give you all praise, all honor, and all glory. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Everybody says, amen, amen. Church, we'll see you right here next Sunday, 9-11-1. Love you guys.